God, we love you. We glorify you. We honor you. We celebrate you. Right where you are. Well, praise the Lord, Mount Zion and friends. I want to welcome you to Wednesday Bible study right here at Mount Zion Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee. I am so excited that you have tuned in today because we are in an amazing three-part series entitled Vision Driven. And today we are headed into part two of how to support your vision. And I am telling you, 
This is one that you absolutely do not want to miss. God is getting ready to release a word into our lives like never before from our senior pastor, Bishop Joseph W. Walker III. And I promise you, it's going to propel you into the next dimension of your purpose. Now listen, if you missed part one, I need you to go back sometime this week and ensure that you catch up with part one in this series. Now listen, I need you to become a digital disciple. Help me to spread the word that Bible study is going down right now. How do you do that? I'm glad you asked. All I need you to do is hit that share button and let somebody know that we are live and in living color. As you're doing that, I want you to send a text out, send a tweet, make a phone call, do whatever you have to do to let everyone who's connected to you know that Bible study is happening right now. Now listen, as you are doing that, I want to let you know that there is power in connection. I want you to follow our amazing leaders. Follow our senior pastor at Joseph Walker 3. There it is right there on the screen at Joseph Walker 3. As you're doing that, I also want you to follow our phenomenal first lady at Dr. Steph Walker. And we also want you to be in the know of all of the latest happenings here at Mount Zion by following our ministry at MT Zion Nashville. And I promise you, it will be a blessing to your life. Mount Zion, we have been doing some amazing things thanks to you and thanks to the hand of God that rests upon this ministry. And it's, we cannot do what we do without you. And so we just wanna tell you, thank you for supporting this ministry. Thank you for supporting the vision. And we cannot do what we do without you. But I have a question for you. Has God been good to you? If he's been good to you, what I want you to do is I want you to testify. Come on, let's take a few seconds and testify and let someone know in the chat that God has been good to me. He woke us up this morning. He started us on our way. He clothed us in our right mind. And by you being connected to this Bible study right now, that's a testimony in itself that God has been good to you. Did you know that there's no way that you can sow into good ground, into fertile ground and not reap a blessing? I want to let you know and remind you that this is fertile ground. This is good ground. We have been receiving your messages week in and week out of how you've been trusting God in the area of giving and how you have been seeing the benefits of being a good steward over what God has given you and trusting God in this area. So what I want you to do right now I want you right now to get a liberal seed in your hand. I want you to give today on a level that matches your faith. I want you to get that seed in your hand. The ways that you can give are right there on the screen. I want you to get that seed. We're getting ready to pray over that seed. And I just speak it over your life that when you sow this seed today, you're going to see a harvest come from this seed. I want you to mark this moment, mark this date, write this down, that when you sow into this ministry, when you sow into fertile ground and trust God, you are going to reap a blessing because you're trusting God in this area. Some of, for some of us, we're going to see it before the end of the service. For some of us, we're going to see it throughout this entire year. And I want you to be sure that you get in on this blessing. I speak it and I declare it over your life that this seed is gonna release some things in your life. My God, I feel that, I don't know about you, but I receive it myself. Are you ready to give? Let's pray over that seed. Lord, we love you, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for the gift and the giver. Father, I pray that the seed that is sown today will come back 10 and 100 fold into the life of those who are sowing a seed on today. We trust you with this seed, we give you praise and glory, and we stand in expectation and anticipation of what we're getting ready to receive because we are trusting you in this area. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Woo. I don't know about you, but I received that prayer as well. I am so excited, Mount Zion, about this word that Bishop is getting ready to release into our lives. So what I need you to do right now is I need you to center yourself. I need you to get your iPad, your iPhone, your notebook, your pen, whatever it is that you use to take notes. I need you to get that right now because we are about to dive deep into part two of how to support your vision. I tell you what, without further ado, Bishop, we're ready to receive this word. Let's go to work. Thank you so much, Pastor Brad Shaw, and let's get right to the word of God. If you've been with us on this series, you know 
how incredibly important it is for us to be vision driven. That's what we're talking about. I want to move now into how to support your vision. And this is going to be one that will change your life. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 10 through 20, and I think it's important to read this in context. Not one scripture pulled out, but the entire context. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, Paul says, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity, Paul says. You wanted to do it, but you didn't have a chance. Not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content, Paul says. I know how to be a base. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned how to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, Philippian church, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds on your account. <laughs> Boy, that's a blessing. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Ephrodotius the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And he says, as a result, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Whew. Yo, Paul transitions here to focus on God's provision. Let me help you understand something. Let me say something at the beginning. Listen to this. When I have a vision, that vision must remain under divine supervision. If that vision remains under divine supervision, I will always have provision, never division. You will never have a vision you can afford because if you have something that you see that you can afford, it's a good idea, but it's not vision. Vision is always bigger than your budget, bigger than your wallet. It's bigger than your bank account. That's why it scares you. But I'm going to show you how God funds purpose, funds vision. And right here in this passage, right into verse 20, he begins, Paul begins with this recurring theme of rejoicing. Paul is excited to write to this church at Philippi. He's writing this letter to thank the readers for the financial gift they sold into the ministry, which Ephrodotius had brought to Rome on their behalf. The generosity of the Philippian Christian was consistent with, much, with, with, with what we see in Scripture in other places, but not like this. They were, they were kind of like trendsetters here but it was appreciated by Paul, and he recognized something, right? He recognized that the Philippians have an ongoing and sincere interest in his well-being. Now, you have to understand, first century, you got to understand Paul, he's carrying the gospel, so they're sowing for the kingdom advancement. Here's the deal, they are sowing in the kingdom advancement. Paul knew about their support, and regardless of whether they sent additional financial help or not, he stresses, this father by recognizing that he appreciates the gift. But Paul was more concerned about not seeking the gift, but how the gift would then turn around and be a blessing to them. Because as you sow into the ministry, Paul says, the fruit will abound in your life. See, the Philippians had no one to take the gift to Paul until Ephrodotus left to visit him in Rome. So it was only then that these believers had a safe way to send support to Paul during the time under his house arrest. Paul's in a, in a place of distress, but they got a gift to him, meaning that regardless of the circumstances, they were able to still get a seed to him. And Paul was thanking God because out of all the churches that had visited, one church saw the necessity of sustaining him 
through what God called him to do or his vision. They found the necessity of funding the vision, funding the vision. And God sent them to be of support to him. God's got people he will assign to support your vision. Now that's why it's important to understand influence of stewardship, how to create buy-in. Because people do not first follow worthy causes. You know what they do? They follow worthy leaders whose causes they believe in. See, people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. And as a manager of the vision, your success is measured by your ability to actually take people where they need to go. You can only do that if the people first buy into you, believe in you. Gaining buy-in is so important. And there are three steps that's gonna help you get this done. Listen, write these down. Craft your vision carefully. Practice communicating it. It should connect with and inspire all stakeholders, including yourself. Influence is a transference of emotion. You cannot convey emotion if it's not within you to convey. You can't be bland and just, you know what, simply just up here dull. You, you got to be excited about what God has shown you. Make sure you've done your homework and that, you know, 100% is brought to the table when you're communicating your vision and your convictions of why you're doing it. Excitement breeds excitement. Excitement breeds excitement. But here's the other thing. Credibility is currency. See, this has nothing to do with money. I'm speaking about building trust. Building your trust account within internal and external relationships. When you make a commitment, you create hope. But when you deliver on that commitment, you create trust. I won't say that again. When you make a commitment, you create hope. Boy, they said they were going to do this. But when you come through on that, you create trust. Always deliver. Don't find excuses. Find a way. Make it happen. Remember, people often hear what they want to hear. But make sure your expectations are set properly and there is a complete understanding. Because credibility is the currency for a leader. Because with it, you have options, and without it, you're broke. But here's that third thing, leverage momentum. Momentum matters. Momentum, movement, it matters. And without momentum, you know, I talk about this in my podcast, and I encourage you to download it, Next Level Leader Podcast. It's free, Dr. Joseph Walker. I talked about just a couple of weeks ago, consistency, because momentum is important. Without momentum, the smallest obstacles can derail you. With momentum, the largest obstacles cannot fail you. Find opportunities to generate small wins, man. Get, get the people around you. Get, get, get the people believing that they can achieve this. This is what it's all about. There's no substitute for success when it comes to creating confidence and belief in the leader. So as a leader, and I'm talking to you because you're just that. You are a leader. Yes, you are. In your business, in your job, in your school, wherever, you're a leader. You've got to have a great mission and a worthy cause. That's the start. I got a vision, I got a cause, guess what? But it won't be enough to get people to follow you because if you call yourself a leader and nobody's following you, you're just taking a walk. You have to become a better leader in order to get others to buy into your vision. A lot of folk call themselves leaders, but there's no, no buy-in. See, the work you put into this is the price you will pay if you want to give your vision the best chance of becoming a reality. Now, let's get back to this idea of support, because you're going to need money to make this happen. Every vision is going to have to be funded. Vision, supervision, provision. How does the provision come? 
financial stewardship. Reconcile your supply and demand. Philippians 4.19. Now, how many times have you quoted this scripture? Let's be honest. How many times have you quoted this scripture? And my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, there is power in partnership. Most visions aren't supported because the visionary doesn't believe in partnering with others. The vision has to be bigger, as I said last week, than you. You know, when Joseph got a vision in Egypt, Joseph, you know, I've been stuck on this ever since New Year's Eve, and you know, we're under this anointing, this Joseph anointing in this ministry and over the wall. But you know, in Genesis 41, 46 through 49, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid it up the food in the cities. He laid up every city in every city, the food of the fields which surrounded them. And Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting. for It was immeasurable. And Joseph did three things that ensured his success in taking care of Egypt. And I want you to pay attention. He, he, number one, he gave a clear direction to all in Egypt of the meaning of the dream. <laughs> I'm not out here just talking. This is a real dream. Secondly, he gave clear expectations as to what each one was to do. And thirdly, he gave a clear outcome on how Egypt would survive the famine. Clarity. And while Joseph focused on the welfare of the whole nation of, of Egypt, there was no doubt that Joseph personally prospered as well. His vision for partnership in Egypt did a lot of things, and I want you to hear it. See, vision gave Joseph the ability to see what was in the future. That's what vision does. It helps you kind of get a glimpse of what God's about to do. But vision gave Joseph the ability to deal with situations with great wisdom. And vision also gave him the foresight to prepare for the future. Can I drop this on you just parenthetically? I'm going to drop it on you for free. Right, because vision does give us wisdom for the future. But I want you to hear something. God prospered Joseph in the vision. The vision that God gives you, when you make the vision bigger than you, God's going to also prosper you in it. God ain't giving you a vision for the world that's not supposed to bless you as well, but you can't think about you first. You have to think about the vision is bigger than me. But by default, you will be blessed as a result of stewarding God's will in the earth. The story of Joseph reveals a great truth that to truly affect the world, our vision must be bigger than just meeting our needs. It's got to be also about providing answers for the world. Man, this is what I've always tried to do in Mount Zion. I, I, I remember when I first got here, man, God was giving me a vision and I would say, Lord, you know, how are we going to do this? And you know, when you, anybody can go build a church and, you know, go into debt. But, but, but I knew God told me, I'm not, you're not going to be a leader. First of all, God told me, I'm not going to let you be a leader who's going to talk about building buildings, have a building fund, and never have a building. You know, you got a building fund, but you never see the building. That wasn't going to be my legacy. But also, not just building a building and building ministry, but I wanted to be able to not only secure funding for it, but also get people out of debt to show them what's possible, right? To show people that if you partner in ministry and vision and soul, your life inevitably will be blessed. And boy, the testimonies I have seen in this ministry, the testimonies of people that have supported vision, have given to this place, People, I have done so many house blessings and I have seen so many businesses be blessed. I mean, you can testify right in the chat 
Many of you right now in Atlanta, in Huntsville, in the DMV area, in Louisiana, in all around the world, right here in Nashville, in Brentwood, in Smyrna, in Antioch, in, in Goodlesville, wherever you, wherever you are, you can testify, North Nashville. Your life has been directly impacted because you have supported God's vision. See, when you support what uniquely belongs to God, God in turn turns around, whoo, and he blesses you. See, generosity is both so shown and received. Generosity always seems to be a part of, 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 of my DNA. From the earliest days, I can remember being around people who were generous, my mom and my dad and my family. We were just givers. We were taught to do that, not to be hoarders, not to be reservoirs of selfishness, but channels of blessings, right? Giving their monies and their gifts, whether to the church or friends or people in the community. We, we surrounded ourselves with people who had a spirit of generosity that, that, that I can't, can't help but model in my life right now. One of the ways you can ensure that people are generous is, 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 is giving them opportunity to support something that matters. It doesn't mean that, you know, people don't want to do it, but people are not going to sow into things that don't matter. See, here's the deal. People of God, I believe in sowing and reaping. It works. Did you hear me? I said, it works. When you sow into the kingdom, when you sow into the kingdom, vision of God, man, you don't know how God going to choose to bring a harvest in your life. I thank God I pastor a very generous congregation, people who go over the wall. That's why this year, I'm telling you, I ain't playing. We go, we, woo. Y'all, we are going over the wall in our giving. I give back to the community, our sowing, I'm blessing people, all because our giving is going over the wall because you're going over the wall in how you support what God is doing in this place. Being around generous people is contagious, just like being around cheap people is contagious. But the Bible has a lot of amazing stories about generosity of God's people. If you think about it, <laughs> the whole Bible is a story of God's great generosity towards us. We know that we're always receiving God's generosity, but we have to position ourselves to reflect that same generosity in the lives of those who are around us. Man, I'm teaching my children that. Teaching my children, Dr. Steph and I are teaching our children how to be generous and how to give. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, give and it shall be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom for the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you. Man, remember when Elijah, <laughs> um, back there in 1 Kings, he, he, he runs into the widow woman? It's a powerful story. The story of Elijah is in the widow's oil when she ran out. The widow has no money to pay her creditors, and he has, you know, threatened to take her two sons to be slaves. It's an interesting story. Can you imagine that? The desperation she must have felt. And Elijah tells this woman to find many jars, right? Tells her to find as many jars as she could find and use her one jar of oil to fill them. And the oil lasted and lasted forever. She paid off her debts and saved her son. That's a powerful story. I used to always say that story, man, can you make me a cake first? And she's like, Wait, are you kidding me? I'm out here about to die, man, my son, and you say, give it to me first. But it's, a, it's an example of generosity, a priority. It's about responsibility and stewardship. If you give it to God first, watch what God would do. Here are the lessons. Seek wisdom. There's seven lessons with this woman with the oil. Seek wisdom. First Kings 4 and 1, a certain woman of the wives is second Kings. Uh, the certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. See, when you're in trouble, seek godly wisdom to gain a new perspective. Stop, stop 
asking folk whose lives are in worse shape than yours or people that have no credibility whatsoever, man, get godly wisdom on what to do. Here's the second thing. Use what you have to get what you need. In 2 Kings 4 and 2, so Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? What do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Well, you got some. You got some. Don't minimize what you have. Use what you have to get it done. Are you hearing me? Know how to use what you have to get it done. But number three, so where you want to go. The widow only had one small jar of oil, of olive oil, yet she was instructed to pour it out. Don't be tempted to hold on to something because you can't see where the next supply is coming from. Man, God's mouth is different. God will multiply your seed if you trust him. He will. You holding on to it. I tell you all the time, if, it, if it's not big enough to pay your bills, sow it. <laughs> Number four, it doesn't take much. <clears throat> In 2 Kings 4, 6 and 7, now it came to pass when the vessel was full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons live off the rest. Wow. And this widow woman became a distribution channel. Doesn't that sound cool? How I tell you how God's going to use Mount Zion to be a conduit, to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. What? Did y'all hear me say that on New Year's Eve? That's what God told me to tell you. That's our vision. God's going to use this place to be a conduit, a channel of distribution to the kingdom. Man, with just one small jar of oil, this woman was positioned like Joseph, like you. That's powerful, man. Number five, resources are closer than you think. Second Kings 4 and 3, then she said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. She did not depend on her own supply, y'all. She sought her neighbors and friends' resources, and they invested in this venture. Don't be afraid to ask for help, man. People don't mind partnering with stuff that's going to be a blessing. Here's number six. God will make you a provider. She was quickly able to sell her product because she was providing something that everyone needed at the time. That's how God will take your vision and set you up. God will put something in your hand that people need and make it a point of exchange to be a blessing in your life. Number seven, your problem can make you the solution. God gave her supernatural abundance, resources, and provision because she obeyed his word. In the widow woman's situation, man, in her indebted state, God made her an entrepreneur. Use what she had despite her weakness, her frailty in terms of being afraid. And, you know, out of all of that, being tired and, you know, feeling like she's about to die, the Lord turned her situation around, turned her misery into a miracle. And God wants to do the same thing for you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, hear me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, will I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then... I am strong. You see, God has a way of getting provision to fund the vision. All you got to do is trust him. Let me tell you a secret I learned some years ago in the scripture. Nobody will ever support your vision 
if you don't support God's vision. So I'm talking to tithers. I'm talking to supernatural sea sores. I want to challenge you to do something right now. I want a spirit of generosity to break out right now. I want a spirit of generosity to break out. You know how to give. I'm not going to ask you what to give. I just want right now a spirit of generosity, a seed to be sown right now, whatever God is telling you. I want you just to be generous. I want this ministry to be so generous that it's at a point where like we overflow all the time. I want right now this word to trigger in that chat, in the giving app, text to give. I want right now from where God is about to take you, put a seed on in his kingdom and watch what he will do. Thank God for you today. I hope you were blessed. Man, God will support. He will support your vision. He will bring supernatural supply. But you got to have a relationship with him. I keep saying it's all about alignment. If we're going to be vision driven, we got to start out being connected to the one who gives the vision. If you need a relationship with him, if you need to get back right with him, you need a church home where you can grow, it doesn't matter what denomination you come from, what color you are, it's about you just saying, I want to be where God wants me to be. Here's your chance right now. What I want you to do, take out your phone, I want you to text the word salvation to 63975. You see it? Salvation. 639, 63975. Do that. I guarantee you. Our team is going to follow up with you. And we're so grateful to have you watching today. Share this link with as many folks as you can. Please do that. I promise you it'll bless you. And I can't wait to be back next Wednesday to share the concluding part of this series with you. I pray God's blessings be upon you and yours. Until then, may God bless you. That's our prayer. Remember, we are vision driven. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's Bible study, and I pray you have been blessed. You know, we here at Mount Zion believe God has allowed us to grow as disciples, and as a consequence, we believe our time, talent, and treasure matters. We are mature believers, and I want to give you an opportunity, if you missed it earlier, to sow, to give. If you've been blessed, I want you to put seed into good ground your tithe, your offering, sow a liberal seed right now. The platforms are right here. Make sure you do that. And we thank God. Also, let us know if you're being blessed. We would love to hear from you. And we appreciate you so much. May God bless you. Is our prayer.